PDP's National Working Committee names Yemi Akinwomi as national chairman. This is happening as a court restores Uche Zakandas as the party's chairman. With the party in disarray, what viable opposition can there be to the ruling of Progressive Congress? President Muhammad Buhari announces NNPC's first operating profit in 44 years. Also coming up is a review of the, the day's newspapers. We have The Punch, The Daily Independent and The Guardian. And with that, we say good morning and thanks for joining us on The Breakfast here on PLOS TV Africa. It's another Friday morning's edition and we hope that you, of course, enjoy the next two hours. I am Osao Gye, Ogbawa. And I am Annette Felix saying good morning and thank God it's Friday. Good morning, Osao Gye. Good morning. Um, our first top trending story today is one, you know, that many Nigerians will be excited to hear. The fact that students who have been in captivity for about 16 weeks have returned. Um, first of all, the thing is that with the, with the principal of this particular school, it's a, a school in Niger States and it's called the um, Tegina Islamiya School. Um, the bandits had called the principal asking for ransom. And um, the state governor had said that no ransom would be paid, but that they were negotiating with the bandits. But what we know now is that um, 15 of these kids have been freed, even though six of them had died in captivity because they were ill. So we have no idea if a ransom was paid for their release. But the good news is that after almost, almost two months in captivity, the students are now back home and safe. Um, yeah, well, more than two months, actually. Um... Uh, 16 weeks is uh, is quite a while. Uh, that's uh, that's about four months actually. Um, it, it's um, you know well. I, I guess the parents can celebrate, you know, and say um, you know, and thank God, you know, that their kids are finally back home, you know, in their arms, you know. But unfortunately, uh, six of them died, you know, in, in you know in this time that they were in captivity. Um, according to the uh, news story, it says um, they died, you know, after falling sick mm -hmm. in captivity. Um, which is, you know, really, really heartbreaking. And so there is some parents, you know, who, uh, while others are celebrating, are mourning, you know, and realizing that their kids will never come back after they were, you know, they were um, kidnapped. Um, there will always be the conversation about whether ransom was paid or not. Uh, the government will, of course, you know, has said that ransom was not paid. They were negotiating. Um, what are the details of the negotiation? Nobody, you know, is sure. Um, lately, we've heard about bandits and kidnappers, you know, requesting bags of rice and requesting motorcycles and some some of all of that. Um, there's also been parents who said that they paid ransom, even if the government, you know, would say otherwise. Um, so it's important that we find clarity with some of all these things. Um, the question, of course, will be what next, you know, after these people have been set free? Will these bandits, you know, or these kidnappers rather, mm -hmm. will they be, you know, will the government go after them still? You know, are they still a threat to the society across Nigeria? Um, will they be arrested? You know, is it possible that we can pinpoint their location now and know, you know, where they kept these kids all the while? Is it possible that we can track them and find out where they are? And, you know, what, very likely what their next operation would be. Um, what steps have we taken to prevent school abductions in, in Nigeria? And over time, you know, and I've said this repeatedly, that over time, Nigeria as a country doesn't seem to learn lessons. You know, we see very, very tragic incidents and we don't seem to learn. We only just, you know, would, would mourn and we'll be sad and we'll talk about it for a couple of days. But the government itself doesn't seem to learn what lessons, um, you know, that it can take from every single incident. In what ways... Have our security agencies been, you know, improved on? You know, in what ways have the processes with regard to security been improved upon to prevent another uh, school kidnap? Um, there's been talk of, you know, I think you've mentioned a few times if schools should be shut down temporarily and some of all of that, which you know um, I personally don't agree with. You know, I feel like we need to do better as a country in protecting school students and not just students. You know, everybody who is a Nigerian needs to be protected by Nigeria's. Uh, secu uh, you know, security architecture from kidnappers. We should be able to improve on the processes. There are still people in, in captivity currently um, from Kaduna State and a few other places. Um, we should, you know, be able to learn and improve on the processes with the grad security so that we can protect school students in the future um, instead of waiting for the next kidnap to, you know, to, you know, take to happen and then, you know, we're back at it again. So, congratulations to those parents. I'm happy that the kids are back home. Uh, we hope that this never repeats itself. 
But from the way that we've continued to run government and run the security architecture in Nigeria, it doesn't seem very likely that we will not hear um, of another kidnap, you know, um, anytime soon. Yes, and our next top trending story is about something that, you know, social media has been talking about um, in the past few hours. And it's about an alleged arrest of reporters or presenters that work at channels television. Um, we saw um, the NBC, the National Broadcasting Commission, um, put out a statement that it called a notice of infraction. It drew attention to the broadcast of the program, Sunrise Daily, that aired at 7 um, on Tuesday, August 24th, 2021, saying that, you know, on this program, they had the guest, um, the executive governor of Benue State, Samuel Autumn, and that that interview was observed to contain inciting, divisive, and unfair comments that the anchors did not thoroughly um, interrogate. They went on to say that these negates the provisions of the NBC code, and it said that uh, you know broadcasters should ensure professionalism, that they should not focus or lead to unfair treatment, that no broadcast should encourage or incite crime or lead to public disorder or hate, and that all broadcasts should be equitably presented for fairness and balance. So they went on to say this, and um, the next thing we heard on social media was that um, two presenters of Channel Television had been arrested. But um, contrary to that, we've seen a statement from Channel Television. It titled this, No Channel Television Anchor Was Arrested. We also um, saw statements from the DSS as well, saying that they did not arrest any presenter on Channel TV, saying that they were actually invited, that's the word, they're not arrested, but invited for a meeting by the National Broadcasting Commission in Abuja, and that they have since returned from the meeting. Um, the DSS also clarified that they were invited by the Secret Service and that stories in the media of the arrests were false and misleading. So that really is the fact. Um, according to Channel Television, the anchors um, were in Abuja after being invited, not arrested again, and that they're back. Well, um, I'll start from the DSS um, angle, uh, talking about them being invited and not uh, arrested. What's the invitation for? You know, in what ways did they, you know, cause a security breach across the country? In what ways are they a security threat to Nigeria? And I'm talking of those two presenter TV anchors now. Um, so, what's the need of the DSS invitation in the first place? Is, is that isn't that um, meant to be for you know high level security uh, breaches across Nigeria and threats to Nigeria? What, what concerns the DSS with what happened on a television program and the conversations that we had on the television program? Um, there have been other people who have been on television across Nigeria that um, have created you know pretty much the same uh, conversations across the country, but didn't get the same invite from anybody. And so, um, yes, they weren't arrested, you know, and immediately I saw that also on the news. I knew that that was, you know, a fake um, story, that they weren't arrested. But, you know, the DS is going to have to say that they were invited. What, what exactly is the invitation for? And that's, that's what I, I, I don't understand. Um, second, the NBC um, has its rules, you know, and there was always also complaints when there was going to be a, an amendment to the NBC uh, law uh, a few, not long ago, a couple of months ago. Uh, there was people who pointed out, you know, that some of these things are a little bit stringent and, you know, it doesn't seem, um, you know, uh, democratic, you know, in quote. Um, but it has its rules and, of course, every television station and, you know, every media organization needs to play by those rules. Um, and uh, with regards to fairness and balance and, you know, being able to counter, it's not the easiest thing to be able to, I mean, you cannot, and that's, I'm speaking as, a, as someone who's been on radio and, you know, now is currently on TV, it's not entirely the easiest thing to be able to spot when a person or, or to predict when a person would go um, above, uh, you know, the rules. Um, it's not very easy to know that the guest that you have might say some things that may not be, um, you know, palatable, you know, to society. Uh, so, so it's always, um, it, it always puts you on the edge, basically, that when you have a, a guest, uh, you would always be very, very cautious and pay very close attention to everything that they say. Um, but there's also possibilities that when they say certain things, you personally as a, uh, a radio or TV presenter don't see anything entirely wrong or inciting with the statements that they've made. And so you would ignore it. Uh, there are times when you would have to tackle I remember when I was on radio, there are times when I had to now be extra, extra careful. And there are things that maybe weren't even issues, but I would still go ahead and tackle it because 
um, or to put some caution just because you know I needed to stay on the safe side of the NBC. And so it puts TV and radio present media you know presenters on the edge every single time, knowing that there is a you know the, there is the NBC who continues to you know almost threaten. Um, you know, to sue or th not to sue now, but threaten, um, you know, sanctions and punishments, you know, for some of all these things. Um, but, you know, that's the life of, you know, people who work in the media space. Mm -hmm. um, but we always, we still have to respect and work, you know, with the rules uh, laid down by the NBC. Um, another thing that I would, you know, also say is the uh, part where it seems like clockwork. Every time that there is an incident on TV or on radio, statements that are made that create some level of conversation. You know, you know, there's a particular level of conversation that seems a little embarrassing to the Nigerian government. There's always some action um, or reaction. There's always some knee-jerk reaction by some agency, uh, someplace. The NBC has, you know, you know, taking you know, these actions every now and then. The Minister of Information, um, um, Gar Bashir, who has also you know, been seen, Every time that there is some conversation that seems a little bit embarrassing to the Nigerian government, it happened with Twitter. And when the Twitter thing happened, they blamed it on Namdi Kano and IPOB and some of all of that and said that they were a threat to Nigeria's uh, you know, um, unity and some of all of that. But you know, everybody who looked closely at that saw or could see that it had nothing to do with any other thing that happened in the past. But because of that particular tweet that was deleted, that's what spawned all of, all, all of this. And it's pretty much the same thing with this incident. It wasn't Governor um, or Tom's, or from what I see, it wasn't really Governor or Tom's statements, you know, saying the things that he said, being critical, critical of the current administration and, you know, speaking, you know, concerning Islamizing and saying that from what he has seen, it doesn't seem, you know, very, you know, like he, he can almost now believe that there is a plan to Islamize Nigeria. Those were some of the things that he said. Um, but it doesn't seem like that was the trigger. It feels more like it was the interview, which was about 48 hours ago, of uh, uh, a retired, you know, uh, Commodore Kunle Akiumi, who made some very, 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 you know, shocking revelations and made some statements on their platform also. That seems to be the trigger, not Governor or Tom. Um, but, of course, you know, they, they have taken, you know, the steps that they, they feel, you know, is right for them to take. Um, people have, you know, also pointed out that this might look like silence in the media or trying to silence opposition in the country and also said that there have been other people from uh, Rawa Consultative Forum, from, you know, Sheikh Gumi, many, many other people who have said, you know, things that the you know, Nigerians have seen as, you know, threatening or have seen as, as incitive, but there wasn't the same reaction to it. Um, well, I think I'll leave it there and just, I'll pr probably just leave it there. All right, so with the President Muhammadu Buhari administration, many have likened it to a dictatorial military style rule um, because when they take a look at the amendments that were to be made to the NBC Act, um, remember how basically uh, many media organizations came up to publish this in the media to say that they refused to be silenced by the media. Um, the big headlines then read information blackouts. So that's exactly what's going to happen if these amendments are made. Stringent fines, you know, for journalists, you know, also penalties including arrest of journalists who say things that are deemed incited. You know, so imagine if that you know, had become law, maybe it's be a different story we'll be talking about regarding these presenters and any other presenter that was deemed to be saying or condoning inciting statements on their platform. You know, so that's really is what it is right now. Um, you want you take a look at the situation um, with Agba Jalingo and so many other journalists that have been in prison for a while. You know, it makes you um, understand when people put two and two together and criticize the present administration as being unfair to the media or attempting to gag the press. Um, let's move over now to um, the story in Afghanistan. Uh, we know what's been happening there regarding the crisis with the Taliban takeover, um, but yesterday we saw twin blasts where just outside the Kabul airport um, where lots of Afghanistan had been thronging just to get a flight out and into safety. Um, there were twin bomb blasts. Um, um, We've seen different reports. One mentioned that just about three U.S. Marines um, were injured. Another report we've seen from the New York Times said about 13 um, were injured, and many others, um, and many others who are not U.S. citizens injured as well. You know, so they have a, 
an August 31st deadline to make sure they evacuate all U.S. citizens and all foreigners out of the country. So you can totally understand why whoever was responsible behind that blast would choose that airport as, you know, that site, because that's really where people are, you know, just going to, to make sure that they leave the country in due time. So... This bomb blast is just coming at the back of a UK government uh, intelligence report that um, there was credible threat of an attack at the airport um, because, of course, there's been an unprecedented surge in travellers um, as foreigners and, and Afghanistan scamper to leave the country in the wake of that Taliban takeover. But um, United States President Joe Biden has responded to this, and he said that um, to those who carried out this attack, as well as those who wishes America ham, Know this, we would not forgive, we would not forget, we will hunt you down and make you pay. Joe Biden added that they will respond with a force of precision at their time and the place they choose and in the moment of their choosing. So the U.S. here is saying that they are determined to um, not forgive or forget and punish all who were responsible for that. And uh, that has led to the uh, injury of some U.S. Marines. Uh, well, it's, uh, th I don't think it's just injury. I think about 12 marine lives, uh, lives uh, 12 marines were lost yesterday, according to uh, reports that I've seen. Um, they weren't just injured, about 60 people, according to reports also, you know, also died yesterday in that blast, including 12 U.S. marines. Um, so I'm sure that's where Joe Biden is uh, speaking from, you know, the loss of American soldiers once again. Uh, the, this, all of this is coming from the uh, confusion with regards to America's pulling out of Afghanistan. Um, and, you know, who really is to blame for the chaos that ensued after? Why didn't the Afghan forces, you know, be strong enough? Or why weren't, weren't they strong enough to continue to hold their country together after the United States pulled out? Um, there is, you know, different analysts. And I've listened to a lot of podcasts from the Washington Post or the Daily, um, you know, numerous BBC podcasts also, um, analyzing the situation and trying to figure out what exactly, um, if, if there was any way that the United States could have pulled out, and still left the Arab um, or the Afghanistan um, army strong enough to hold their country together. Um, a lot of people have said that there's you know, almost no way you know, that that could have happened, mostly because the Afghan forces, ha forces had uh, read the room and seen you know, the, the different stages with America's pulling out. Um, there has also been you know, controversy and you know, discussions concerning um, you know, the strength of the Afghan army, there were about 300,000 compared to 75,000 75, uh, strong um, uh, Taliban for, um, army um, and why they weren't able to defend themselves. But, you know, that's on the side. There's going to be people who will be questioned um, in the next few months about what happens after Afghanistan's pullout, what have, um, after U.S. Marines uh, rather pull out. There's going to be questions about what really happens in the next few weeks and, you know, who, who really is to blame if it was from President Donald Trump or it is Joe Biden's failure to manage the situation properly. And um, is this also, you know, the war engine, the war machine, you know, of, you know, of different countries starting to creep up again? Uh, because there's people who, fi who finance these things, who sponsor these groups, ISIS, the Taliban, Boko Haram, and some of all of that. Um, what message are they trying to send after that bomb uh, blast yesterday? Is there, you know, need for Americans to stay back a little longer? It's, it's many, 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 many questions that I feel need to be answered in the next couple of weeks um, as we continue to see uh, things unfold in Afghanistan. Yes, we'll take a break here um, and we'll come back to analyze the papers on Off the Press. Stay with us.